My name is Brian Myers. I'm an applications developer with Logic. And if you're here, you're in the 3.30 to 4 session entitled Next Generation 911, Placing GIS as the Cornerstone to Emergency Response, presented by David Lucas, Mission Critical Partners, uh, Paul Nave, Owensboro, Davis County 911, and Mike Sunsteri, Kentucky 911 Services Board. And I'll just refer uh, attendees to the online um, agenda for their bios. And uh, just a reminder before I turn it over uh, to, uh, to David, Paul, and Mike, just a reminder to enter your questions in the chat window and they will be answered at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you so much, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanna thank you for joining the presentation today. In 1968, 911 started with a call from Alabama, and the crux of it is a telephone number was associated with an address in a database. And that was great until 1999 until cell phones started to kick in. And then we went back in time. We couldn't locate you because you were on a cell phone and it didn't give us anything. And then it came into phase one and phase two, and we got tower formation. So now we're at the phase of NG911, which is considered uh, the crux of the next generation 911 is having a dispatchable location. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, dispatchable locations, because in the future, by doing this data and getting it in, in our timeline that we have, we're preparing the Kentucky, the Commonwealth, for the phone companies able to dip a mapping GIS database in the future present the 911 center with a dispatchable address based off the GIS lat long, and they get first responders efficiently and effectively to help save lives. So that's what we're doing, establishing a cornerstone for the future, uh, for tomorrow, to get this established. David, the next slide. So this, I'm the, the chairperson of uh, sub ad hoc committee of the Kentucky, Kentucky 911 Service Board GIS Working Group. So myself, Ken Annis with COT, Jimmy Kitchens with Kentucky State Police, Christy Jenkins with Muleberg County, Watson Harding, GIS Specialist, Kentucky Homeland Security, Philip Roth, Kentucky Homeland Security, David Lucas, and Kevin Ho with COT. We hashed out based off the national standards that were established within the last seven to 10 years they hashed out committee meeting after committee meeting, establishing standards across the, the United States, border to border. And we branched off of that and selected many of the aspects, but not everything, in the Kentucky required uh, statute requirements for NG911. David, the next. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, what I'm going to hash out today are the specifics of the Kentucky Next Gen 91 mapping requirements. These are mapping requirements that are actually available on the board's website and we will be going through the requirements that Next Gen 911 has for GIS. Uh, many of you might know me, I used to be the GIS director in Lexington, Kentucky before I became the 911 director in Lexington. So my background is both GIS and 911. So with that, um, I've been assisting the state and many of the PSAP directors like Paul in moving this forward. So the, the requirements that were outlined today are nationally based standards. They're a subset of Nina's I3 requirements. Uh, and the purpose of these requirements are we're gonna start ro routing calls by location. Currently, 911 calls are actually routed based on the cell tower or the cell tower face, not the actual location of the device. So NextGen is moving GIS from just being used in the PSAP for map display to the GIS is actually will be used to verify an address before routing and actually to route the call to the correct 911 PSAP center. And the real crux in the 911 center is the PSAP needs is for a quicker response. We wanna spend more time in the rescue and less in the search. So the better the GIS on the local level that is provided in the PSAP, the quicker we can get to 
the incident and provide rescue services. So let's get into the nitty gritty of what we actually have out there. The existing GIS submittal standards for the 91 centers are as follows. Many of you may be aware of these, you may be working with your local 911 center, but there are three main categories. The PSAP response boundary, which is officially the dispatched area. This is the geographic area that the 911 center is responsible for dispatching. Um, second is the emergency service boundary. These are the polygons or the boundaries that represent the law enforcement, fire, and EMS jurisdictional boundaries. And then finally are the road center lines. We all have been working with road center lines for decades. Um, and this is making sure that the data set is actually consistent throughout the state and also that they meet the needs of NextGen 911. As you can tell from this slide, all of these are current requirements starting back in 2019 and most recently July of this year. All of these data sets are required submittals by the PSAPs to the state 911 board. Uh, and the reason the 911 PSAPs want to do this is it's linked to funding. To continue to get funding from the board, the local PSAPs have to submit these data sets and have to meet the schemas as outlined in the mapping guide on an annual basis. Um, that will be moving to a quarterly basis as well. Additionally, we have update upcoming deadlines. Uh, address points is the next data set that we are looking for. Um, we're all familiar with address points, um, otherwise known as site and structure address points, and the deadline for that is actually July of next year. The specifics and the details are not currently in the mapping guide, but this presentations and ones we've done with others we are using to build the mapping guide and get into it the materials and the details that the people out on the street, the GIS professionals, are going to use as a guideline for their submittals. So on that, today's presentation, we're going to outline the types of address points that we are looking for, the categories as we see them as we are going to outline. The first one are addressed structures. These are structures that are already addressed in each jurisdiction, also known as occupiable space, residences and businesses that are occupied and they already have an address. Next are sub addresses. These are the units, suites, apartments, descriptive narrative uh, for an address that is known as a sub address. It's be below the traditional civic address. And the last one are actually sites and non-occupiable occupiable structures, such as athletic fields, cell towers, landmarks, lakes, actually a body of water. And we'll go through examples of all three of these and when these types of address points are required to be submitted by the PSAPs. So let's talk about some um, structure points. These are what we like to say the perfect world structure points that we all see daily. So the top row you can see these are simple residents on the far left. In the middle you have some duplexes in a single building and then on the far right you have a strip mall which have addresses assigned to Ray Street or Holland Road. Each have their own civic address. Now in this situation the address point is placed just inside the building footprint. Um, another appropriate way of doing it is to actually move the address point to actually be at the entry point of each structure. So in the duplexes you can see the address point is placed at the entry point. On the strip mall is actually placed where the entry point to that unit may be. This is a local preference. We are not looking to regulate that it has to be one way or the other, but definitely we want the address points to be within the building outline or the building footprint. Here's another example of some structure point placement. On the left, you see a very simple commercial building with a point right in the middle, 3421 Sheridan Drive. On the right, you see a business that actually has multiple addresses assigned to each entry point. And this you would actually put 
four dots at the entry point, one for each address, and the same thing at this other entry. So there's actually eight points showed in this aerial photo, four on top of each other in each of these locations. Well, everything's not as simple as we would like it to be because addressing is never simple. We've all grown up with different ways of um, building our GRS. And so in these examples, you see where an actual address point in each of the photographs represents multiple buildings or multiple, multiple structures. On the far left is a very good example of maybe a rural area where they have three or four buildings on one campus and the dot for 170 is placed right in the middle. In the middle, you show a more recent development. This is actually four apartment buildings. They all are 100. However, where do you put the dot? Do you put one on every address building or do you put it right in the middle? And the far right is our fun example that everyone has is a trailer park. The trailer park is at 2032. However, there are multiple unique buildings, in this case, at um, trailers in each one. So do you put one point in each or do you go and put a point on every structure? Obviously for public safety, we want to respond to an individual address point. So we would like one dot on every structure. And we'll get into how we uh, expect the addressing to go for these examples. Here's, we're going back to our example of the office building, very straightforward. However, if you look more detail at this building, there's actually six different units within this facility. So this case, we would want a sub address of a dot for each unit. Each one of these are occupied. Each one has their own unique characteristics. And from a public safety standpoint, when we get a call from a landline, a VoIP or a wireless, and we know we are going to, we want to know we're going to unit C. We don't want to come into this building and be doing more search to find out where the incident may be. Another viable way is putting at the access point, all units are right here. And then these are your two options for addressing sub address placements. Continuing, we'll go back to our lovely trailer park. You can see two ways of doing this. Um, on the right, you can see this is all 550 address and they assigned a lot number to every one of these um, trailers. So they're all 550 on this street and then they all have a sub address for the lot. They could also have gone and named these roads in between and gave everyone a unique civic address. But in this example, they were using sub addresses as well. As we continue, when we'll talk about site points here, this is a site. There is one campus. It has an address of 3390 First Avenue Southwest, but you can see there's multiple structures and there's multiple non-structured um, facilities that warrant uh, emergency response. Obviously we have a fitness center and a building A, which are structures which we're used to having address, but we would also like for site points to be assigned. We have a tennis court, we have two ball fields. Imagine being on a campus in this area, you might be visiting for a tournament, you might be on the tennis court, but if someone has a heart attack or breaks an arm or there's an emergency response and you call somewhere on this campus, you may not know the address, but where your cell phone or your device is located on this site can determine which address the 911 center will associate with your call. Are you in the fitness center? Are you in the tennis court? Are you actually out here in the ball field where the incident may happen? Their response to 3390 is simple, but what happens when they get on campus? It's a search and rescue. We want to shrink the search time down drastically. And that's what site points, structure points, and sub addresses actually gets down to is reducing the response time. Here's an example of a lake. This lake right here is in Kentucky. You could see that they have traditional address points assigned to the residents. They're highlighted here in green. And so if someone called 
911 from a cell phone, it might choose one of these points as being the closest address, which you would think they would dispatch to. And that would be true, but what if something is not happening in one of these residential areas, but is actually happening in this recreational facility? We recommend that these water bodies, these rec recreational water bodies or attractions be assigned an address or a site point. In this case, each of these water bodies is assigned a unique address. That is so that if something happens within this water body or nearby on the coast, the nearest address may actually be the water body. In the 911 center, if an address comes in or a call comes in associated with 8910 Kingsfisher Lake, they know immediately this is with the water body and they will send a different response than if it actually occurred in the structure of 8970. So the address actually has a corresponding response and this, it might be a water rescue, it could be an ambulance, it could be a lot of other things. And taking this a step further, we suggest you may actually put address points at these ramps, these entry points. A lot of accidents happen actually entering the water as much as in the water. An emergency response to this boat ramp, contrary to this, could be several minutes. These two are actually linked by this road. But imagine this lake went across this road. The response time to this, going all the way around lake to this, could be dramatic. So site points actually are very productive in a 911 and public safety response. But let's talk about access points. Access points are not address points. What they are, they are not required within the GIS data set, but they are very helpful to a lot of 911 centers. A point of access to an address point. So think of it as a child or parent relationship. The, access point is really pointing to the address that we are looking for. It could be related to a driveway entrance, a gate, or some other entrance. However, there will be rules on access points. Um, they must be associated with an address point, but you can do a one to many relationship or a many to one. So many in the GIS industry realize um, that uh, does complement Complement the complicate items as well, just as complicated as me saying it. So let's move forward with some examples of access points. They're prevalent in the rural areas and they're used for no line of sight for a structure or site or a hidden entrance. Um, and so we're all very visual people. So let's move forward with some examples. This is actually an example out of Harlan um, County. This on your left shows a typical map display in a 911 center. You can see the five address points shown on the left. Um, we were able to superimpose that on a recent aerial photo, which more accurately depicts where the address points are. So if we got a call anywhere in this area from a wireless call, it could be associated with many addresses. But what it doesn't show you is that the access to 523 Rain Street is not directly from the road like these. The access point is further south because of the ridge line, and there's actually a creek here as well. The access point down here is how you get to this building here in addition to this barn and this other structure. So access points are used for the routing of a call, getting them to the right access point to further into um, the other information. And here's another example. This is on the top of a hill. It is a blind structure up this long driveway. This is a private drive. If you are driving down this road or even these side roads, you would never see this building, especially when foliage is on. So in this 911 center, they have address points for all of these structures. But this address point in orange has an associated access point. This is where they're going to send the emergency responders. They are going to go to this access point. And once there, they know they will transverse up this private drive to get to the final destination. 
These are two examples of one-to-one -one relationships. Very simple, very straightforward, but very valuable in the 911 centers. Now here's a more complicated one um, from Fayette County. The, we have kind of changed this a little bit to show this right here is 3320 Huffman Mill, which has a one-to-one -one relationship. This access point to this structure. This structure has two entrances. By putting the access point here, it is relevant to the first responders. This is the preferred method of entry. They don't want them to enter to the garage. We want them to enter to the pedestrian access mm -hmm. points here. Now, additionally, we have three other address groupings. We have 3310, 3312, and 3314. These are all accessed off of this private drive that comes up through the campus. Uh-oh, a little too heavy on the pointer. We'll go back here. 3310 is this single structure. 12 actually has two structures in the back. And then of course, 3314 has five structures. All the access points are right here. So emergency response, now this is where they turn in. And within Fayette County, I know that they are required to have signage at each of these turn points so that emergency responders know that down this long drive is 3314. This up here is how you get to 3310. So the combination of access points and signage on the campus is very vital to getting emergency services to the response point in a very timely manner. So you remember my um, slide earlier of uh, our campus, our recreational facilities. The yellow dot represents the common access point. This is where we would want our emergency services to come in to access most of these facilities. However, this building A might have hazardous materials. It could have a lot of different structures and we might want to access it differently. So this building A might have a separate access point than all of the other addresses and sub addresses known on this campus. So you could assign an access point here for this building and then this access for the rest. Let's talk about the details. What are actually in a structure address? This is a category of structure addresses that we're looking for. This goes back to occupiable space. Very straightforward, multiple residents, multiple business, um, family residents, apartment complexes, business parks, strip malls. These are the structured addresses we are most, we want first, and they're a very critical component to the routing of 911 calls and the routing of emergency response. Second are site addresses. And site address, as we mentioned before, would be campgrounds, the boat docks, the slips. Um, the example of the athletic fields. Uh, I have phone booths on here. If you can find a, bone booth, a phone booth and put an address to it, great. Barns, um, the example we had in Fayette County, those were a lot of barns. Many barns um, have um, electric running water. They have more facilities than a lot of houses. And then we showed an example of water bodies and cell towers. Notice the column on the left, we actually have the address as being a mandatory component and sub addresses are conditional. And what we mean by conditional here is if the barn has a sub address, we want it. If it does not, because it has its own civic address, we only want the mandatory civic. So conditional means if it has a sub address, it's required. If it does not have a sub address, it is not a required element. Finally, we have a list of recommended addresses. These are items we recommend um, be assigned an address point in the jurisdiction because they are high response items uh, and they provide great response for our first responders. They go from water towers, substations. Substations are usually utility boxes mm -hmm. or they could be the separate facility. Um, we have a lot of mines and pits in Kentucky. Water bodies, we showed you the example of water bodies greater than two acres or designated for recreational use. And that is because of the high volume of calls. 
And then we also have temporary addresses. Just because the building is temporary, like a construction site or a vegetable stand, doesn't mean someone won't call and have an accident. Actually, we have many accidents from construction sites. And then there's other ones that are based on local authorities. Sometimes they want their air fields. There's a lot of 911 centers that address their railroad crossings because dispatching to an address is how most systems are used. We don't dispatch to an XY coordinate. All right, so let's do, here's a quick review. These are the elements we're looking for in the site structure address points. We talked about structure points, site points, and sub addresses. The recommendation from the committee that we are submitting is that each of these have a rollout of different years. So July 1 of next year was the original date for address points. And we're being more specific that we want the structure points that are already addressed July of next year. Follow that, we expect to get site points as well. And then the inclusion of sub addresses should be included by July of 2023. Those are the rollout of requirements for address points. We can't get it all at once. So some people, once they get started, if you're in an area and you don't have structure points, you might wanna go ahead and collect your sub addresses at that point. So we did a rollout just to accommodate the different levels of GIS that we have throughout the state. Now, understanding that not everyone has the resources to maintain, upkeep, or maybe even start this, the 911 board actually has some funding opportunities for the 911 centers. Um, these are very GIS centric. Um, they have a grant cycles that um, happen every year. And for this, they have moved the first cycle up. So the 2021 grant cycle actually will open in November. Grants will be approved in March, which gives an 18 month grant period. For those who are not aware, the 911 board distributes $3 million per year on average for these grants. And GIS is the number one priority for them in the upcoming grant cycle. But it doesn't just stop there in 2021. We are gonna repeat the cycle in 2022. So there is two chances to get specific grants for your area to collect, maintain, or develop a process so that your address points will be maintained from here on. Now, as this presentation has been very address point centric, I want you to be aware that grants can be used for any of these GIS data sets that are required by the board. So the board is requiring all of these, and these are the timeframes, and the grants that they will be presenting over the next two, or actually the next 36 months, is a vital resource that every GIS centric um, municipality should look forward to getting. This is actually the last slide. I went fairly fast because I wanted to stay within our time constraints. But if we have any q and I'll be um, very happy for myself, Mike, or Paul to address those. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, very interesting presentation. You know, I've always, I've heard about the implementation of E911 for, for a long time. And I've, I know that it's uh, been interested to see it's finally getting, uh, it's finally, uh, only getting uh, implemented, so uh, it's. Uh, I know there's been a lot of work and a lot of planning. Don't go go into it. Um, do we have any any questions? Don't see anything in the chat. The only thing I want to add uh, to this is this is crucial. The old days of us having a database and the phone connected to it are gone. Everything from this point on for for 911 is GIS GIS related. The foundation for NG91 is GIS. So everything that we do from this on is very, it's critical that we have good GIS data that we can get a dispatchable address point. Because if not, we're going to be scrambling to help people. And if we don't do this correctly, we're not going to be able to save lives. So that's the pinnacle that the GIS is maintained and up to date. And we have these layers uh, for a dispatchable location. 
Great, great point. Um, I see. We see. We have a question from Kurt. Um, his question is: Is the address or the centerline data model posted on the KY91 board website? Yes, it is. Um, the mapping guideline is on there, and we also have references to the Nina I3. If you really want to go in a deep dive. Um, but I assume this presentation will be available for presentation and I've embedded those links in the PDF of this presentation as well. Okay, great. Um, we, I've got four o'clock. Do we have, uh, do we have any more questions? If not, just, uh, um, if you've got one, just unmute, feel, feel free to ask. Okay. looks like we've got, uh, got one in. Uh, the red lines and the diagrams confuse me some. Are you just taking, uh, I didn't see the end of that. Did you finish that thought there, Charlene? Taking the access points to the doorway. What was the rest of that question? Okay. Yeah, so I'll repeat the red lines and the diagrams confu were confusing. Uh, are you just taking the access points to the doorway? So access points um, could be anywhere in the footprint. Um, so some local people like to have it at the access point or the doorway. Others like to have it in the middle of the building. That is a local decision. Uh, we just will require the address point to be within the facility or the building footprint. Um, I and think David, the, the red line. Maybe we got to make sure, with, make sure we had, when we get down to the to the complex with apartments, then that's got to be within that footprint of that apartment, so that it's on top of the apartment, so that it give a dispatchable location of that apartment or that suite or that doctor's office and so on. So I believe this might have been the one she was referring to. Um, the the red lines are just kind of a blow up of this building, but. The address points can be inside each footprint or stacked. If you don't know the footprint, I would recommend you stack them. If you know the footprint, I would spread them out. I'll go ahead and take this last question from Kurt. Are local PSAP still periodically submitting data to the 911 Services Board? The answer to that is yes. Uh, it is a requirement of the recertification of a PSAP to submit their data sets. Uh, it's actually in regulation now. We are wanting them submitted quarterly. We've held off on being strict on the enforcement on that because we do have an active RFP on the street to acquire a contracted GIS integration firm to be taking all the locally acquired data sets uh, as gathering uh, PSAP data sets on, for their GIS models are a local requirement. They're going to be pushed up and submitted to this integrator who will do quality assurance, quality control, stitch them all together into a statewide data set, which has never been done in the Commonwealth. So uh, yes, as, as we bring this contracted firm on first of the year, uh, we will be pushing to get more regular submissions and it says it's, people can submit them every day, every week, uh, but there'll be a minimum quarterly submission for data sets moving forward once we get the integrator on board. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else? I do want to mention one last thing in parting. The 911 Services Board has recently brought on a geoprocessing specialist. That's Watson Harding. He's, uh, I believe, on the call today. So if anyone needs a liaison within the board, we do have in-house GIS staff now. Uh, if anyone needs to get a hold of me, uh, it's watson.harding at uh, ky.gov. And there's, um, I think, also my contact information is on the uh, 911 Services Board uh, website for uh, who to contact for GIS uh, questions and submissions. So those of you as GIS professionals in Kentucky on the street, you may be getting contacted by your local PSAPs or perhaps their area development district for folks looking to get some expertise and some assistance moving forward to meet these requirements. As you all know, there's a great variety of capabilities within call centers. Uh, and so there, there are going to be people that are going to be looking for some help. And there will be grant funding to provide it. All right. 
Okay, unless there's anything else, we'll, uh, we'll wrap that up. Uh, excellent presentation, by the way. And uh, just a reminder about this evening's virtual social and virtual map gallery. Be sure to check those out. And uh, with that, uh, I think we'll just uh, we'll wrap things up. Thanks, everybody.